Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster Fall 2020 Speaker Series. We are delighted to have you join us for Dr. Naomi Hossein's talk. A little bit of intro before we dive in. Um, the Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster is um, a relatively new organization at the School of International Service. It provides an intellectual space for SIS scholars, but also broader AU scholars and even beyond AU in this virtual world, whose work uses ethnography, critical theory, and historical research to interrogate structures of domination rooted in historical legacies and contemporary iterations of empire broadly conceived. We use this term to refer to exploitative economic orders, manifestations of power in rule and in sovereignty, and how empires historically and geographically situated the lived experience and how it organizes material and social difference and disparity. So we're very um, excited to um, be joining um, us today with Naomi Hussein, but just to give a quick backdrop of other events that have happened this semester, um, last month, we had um, Dr. Kia Melkor Quick Hall, who is an SIS alum, give her new book, uh, Book Talk Naming a Transnational Black Feminist Framework, Writing in Darkness. This event is now recorded and will live on our archive website, which is coming soon. Also on our archive website, we'll have flyers and events and videos and papers from previous spring symposia, fall symposia, and various um, talks and webinars and roundtables and panels that we've been cultivating over the past few years. So please join us for that. Coming up next month, we have Dr. Carol Gallagher with PhD student Jacqueline Fox giving a presentation on um, could anti-government militias become pro-state paramilitaries? Um, very timely and very important topic. So please join us for that on November 17th on Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, but today we are diving into the work of Dr. Naomi Hussein. She's a senior prof professional lecturer here at the Accountability Research Center at School of International Service. I learned from Jonathan Fox that she was coming to SIS after I had assigned her work for my class on food and ag politics. I was delighted. Um, but this a range of her work, the sheer breadth of her work on critical development studies, on political economy, the politics of education, um, broader political ecology, food riots, is so um, multifaceted and so multidisciplinary. Um, Dr. Hussein joins us from um, many um, kind of professional experiences in academia and well beyond. So she's worked at um, LSE has degrees from Oxford. She just spent time as a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex. Um, and she describes her work after 20 years of development research and advisory experience. She calls her work the politics of provisions. She focuses on price spikes, subsistence protests, widespread worries about the way that we eat now and what economic globalization means for everyone's everyday life and the challenges of politics and governance under con conditions of volatility and commodification. So again, extremely relevant right now. As a feminist, she says, I'm particularly interested in understanding what globalization means for the unpaid care work on which our well-being depends so fully. Um, we're so honored to have her join us here for this particular talk. Um, and this particular talk, let's see, next slide, our final slide here. Um, um, explains um, the broader context of Bangladeshi food aid within the kind of Cold War geopolitics of mid 20th century. Um, and I'll say as someone who studies food aid, the analysis of the geopolitics of food aid from the perspective of biopower is way overdue. So this is kind of an understanding of Agamben and of Foucault and the biopolitics of provisioning and the appropriation of vitality and the control therein. Um, so this particular talk, uh, we're actually co-sponsoring with our colleagues at the Historical International Studies Research Center. And this research cluster, the historians at SIS and the Ethnographies of Empire have had a, now a three-year collaboration. And there's a lot of interesting themes and important themes that have come up that this particular talk today by Dr. Hussein, particularly the history of liberalism, its colonial origins, it's post-colonial entrenchment via racial capitalism, white saviorism, and the neoliberal erasure of the recentness of the modern nation state. But this paper also does so many new things. Um, it's really a political ecology also of the Bola hurricane, one of the worst hurricanes in recorded history. Um, Bangladesh, of course, is like a canary in the coal mine of climate change and bears the brunt of disasters and post-disaster interventions. The paper also analyzes the politics of development 
and how this new country has served as a laboratory for experimental and often dangerous aid from nor plant population control fertility technologies to water sanitation failures that led to the worst mass poisoning in world history. So again, you've got this broader context of critical development against the political ecology of disasters. But most importantly, I think it brings the biopower theory to the topic of US food aid. And thinking about this analysis, she says, she's focusing on the principal motivation for her probe is her sense that there's an unresolved question about the culpability of the US for delayed food aid during the Bangladesh famine of 1974, which may warrant closer investigation. So this is um, a very powerful analysis grounded in a sense of compassion and care, but also truth telling. Um, so we're very honored um, to be um, welcoming Dr. Naomi Hossein. Thank you so much, Garrett. Um, that's a really nice introduction. Um, I'm assume I'm going to have to assume everyone can hear me because I have no way of knowing otherwise. Um, well, thank you very much to Jordana Matlin, uh, Garrett, Grady Lovelace of the Ethnographies of Empire Research Cluster. I, I rather nagged them to let me uh, do a session in this cluster because I really like the seminars, the, the webinars that happen. Now they're webinars, of course. But also uh, Yang Zhang and uh, Libby Thompson of the Historical International Studies Cluster. It's really good of you to co-host. And to Christiana Kasner for setting it all up and advertising. And I just met Kate and Asha who are doing the actual um, work of organizing all of this. So I'm really grateful to have a chance to talk about these issues that I find personally endlessly fascinating. I find I'm drawn back over and over again to the early 1970s and um, what happened in Bangladesh, not only as a way of understanding Bangladesh's history and Bangladesh's particular development achievements and um, deficits, if you like, but, but actually to understand the development project more generally. And you made the point, Garrett, about you know, the origins of the liberal um, project of development. I think this is very much something, a subject of today's talk. I should say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of history, really. I should say this paper is probably going to be published soon. Um, I think it's in the final stages now. I hope it's in the final stages now. Um, but it's a, it's a, it is a kind of history paper in the sense that it's about stuff that happened a long time ago. But I'm not a historian. I'm a social scientist of many different disciplines. Um, and so I feel a little bit um, concerned about talking, uh, talking history with uh, actual historians. So hopefully you'll forgive me my weaknesses. I did want to tell a little story about um, the last time I gave this paper, because I think it gives you a very good sense of the esteem within which, with which Bangladesh is held in the academy, Bangladesh studies, I should say. And this was um, the Association of Asian Studies, and it was held in Washington, DC. I think it was two, maybe three years ago. It takes me a while to get things into print. Um, and uh, it was a, you know, three days, you know, those big conferences, big area studies conferences with, um, uh, must have been, um, you know, a few hundred people, lots and lots of panels on China and India, Japan, Korea, China, India, China, India. Um, and uh, the only panel on Bangladesh was on the third day of the conference um, at 8.45 in the morning, the morning after the big cocktail party. So um, we were, the Bangladesh panel was, uh, was scheduled for that time. And uh, when we got there, when 8.45 on Sunday morning, the day after everyone had been out drinking the night before, um, we had to go in, not into the first building, not to the second building of the hotel, it's that Wardman one in Adams Morgan, but in the third building and you walked up these steps and you went down the steps and you went round corners and it took about 15 minutes from arriving in the hotel to get to the room where the Bangladesh panel was being held. And I remember thinking when I was getting very close to 8.45 at this point, I was thinking when I got to the janitor's closet that probably I'd gone the wrong way. But no, you had to keep going beyond the janitor's closet down another corridor. And finally, at the very end, you found the room where the Bangladesh panel was being held. And this was, I thought, a very good, um, very telling about uh, how we view Bangladesh studies in the academy. And I thought it was, it was actually a very good panel in the end. Some really brilliant scholars were there and it was a very exciting time. But, this is how we think about Bangladesh studies. Now I'm going to share my screen, I'm hoping. This is all going to work. Um, actually, I'm not sure if this is working, is it? Aha, uh -huh. there we are. Um, so I want to talk today about a paper called uh, Bear Life in 1970s Bangladesh, 
the ge it's actually called the geopolitics of bear life in 97 Bangladesh. And I want to talk really a very brief little bit about the, the theory behind this paper, which is uh, Giorgio Agamben's um, state of exception um, and Homo Saka bear life um, theory. I'll talk a little bit about that. But I really want to focus on three moments in the early 1970s um, history of Bangladesh, wh where I think um, Bangladesh and Bangladeshis came to be seen as bear life, came to be constructed as, as, as bear life. By that I mean people living on the very edge of, of survival, people seen as hopeless or helpless and um, almost prehistoric. I was very struck recently reading one of Naeem Mahayman's pieces about the media coverage of the 1971 war in Bangladesh. And he says that Bangladeshis were depicted as pre-technological, um, fighting with sticks and stones almost, I think, um, is the sense. Um, I'm going to also talk about the polar cyclone, which is, um, I think, a very interesting, desperately sad, but very interesting moment. I'm going to talk about the famous or the infamous um, statements by Henry Kissinger, um, then uh, special advisor, I think, to the um, State Department, uh, to, the, to the president in 1971. Um, he used the phrase uh, basket case in relation to Bangladesh. And then I want to talk also about the, the concert for Bangladesh, George Harrison's wonderful intervention in 1971. I'm going to conclude with a little bit of discussion about um, the ways in which these perceptions of Bangladesh's bare life have resulted in a kind of uh, experimental humanitarianism um, and licensed all sorts of uh, policies and uh, programs that, that Garrett was mentioning. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk too much about theory because I'm not a great theorist, but I will um, say a little bit about uh, bare life as a concept. Um, the, I think this has been most made most famous by Giorgio Agamben, who's a, an Italian legal historian um, and draws on Roman uh, history to 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 identify this this figure called Homo Sacca. Um, who was seen as politically unqualified figure, um, a, a, a bare life in the sense of um, a, a, a body on the on the on the on the on the edge of survival, but but without political rights, without without um, without the benefit of the sovereign law. Um, and I think that uh, Agamben has made a lot of advances in the thinking of how sovereignty is determined, who gets to decide who is protected by the law and who is. Uh, not protected by the law. And I'm going to read from the paper because just a couple of paragraphs because it's otherwise a bit difficult to explain. <laughs> um, in this paper, I uncovered two distinct elements in the construction of 1970s Bangladesh that resonate with Agamben's ideas of the political effects of bare life. The first is the exclusionary matter of who gets to be governed by the sovereign power. And I think this is a very familiar use of um, bare life. I think in refugee studies, studies of famine, um, there's some rather excellent work by, among other people, Jenny Edkins, um, about the way in which uh, people suffering from famine are seen as somehow beyond or above the law. Um, the weakness of the Bangladesh state in the 1970s meant it lacked the ad administrative capacity or material resources to make decisions over whether large sections of its population should live or die to exercise biopower, in effect. Um, and then I go on to say that this sense of bare life as the exclusion from the rule of law is widely recognized. People, people know that you know, there's something wrong about depictions of people who are starving, depictions of people who are dying or dead. Um, and they know that partly because it's a way of, of disempowering them, of, of taking away their, their, um, their agency. So this, this sense of bare life, I think, is, is, is known. People are familiar with this. But the second element uncovered by the bare life treatment of the Bangladesh of the 1970s is less commonly acknowledged. This is what could be called the sacred nature of those who are treated as bare life. <clears throat> In Agamben's account, Thomas Sacker was a figure who was unprotected by law and so could be killed with impunity. But their death could never be a sacrifice. It couldn't be a ritual or a religious act. Um, and I think that refugees and people suffering from famine also um, have this kind of, uh, occupy a kind of sanctified place in, in Western liberal thought. Um, and they, in this I say they are akin to Homo Saka as the objects of humanitarian aid are deemed beyond or above political consideration. Um, no personal state ever faced criminal charges for the millions of deaths um, or, of starving or storm swept Bangladeshis in the early seventies. However, the attempt to save them from death would become a sacred, a secular sacred act Holy, not because it was written in scripture, but because it was entirely altruistic without any political intent. So this is really the way 
I use this concept, not just to show that people were on the edge of survival, but also that by virtue of being on the edge of, of survival, efforts to uh, address their um, desperation, their, their, their condition uh, would, would become uh, sacred in some way. Um, I'm going to talk now through these three moments that I think were very telling, very important um, moments in, in early 1970s Bangladesh. And the first one is the Bola cyclone in 1970. Now, this is, is in November the 12th is the 50th anniversary. Um, and it's, it's, still, it's, a, it's still regarded as one of the deadliest storms ever in, uh, in human history because almost half a million people died, which was, I think, um, approximating the uh, deaths from the tsunami. Uh, the, the Boxing Day tsunami. Um, but I won't tell you the whole story, but I will say, because I just really want to focus on the ways in which the Bola cyclone depicted Bangladesh and Bangladeshis um, to the world. Actually, it wasn't Bangladesh at that point, I should say, it was still East Pakistan. But in brief, there was this enormous cyclone um, and the callousness of the then Pakistani government in, in basically not really giving a damn about the people who'd been washed out to sea and um, was rewarded in the first general elections that Pakistan had had. They, they, they held the elections, I think it was two or three weeks after this disaster, um, when uh, the Pakistani government basically let people just die and be washed into the sea without really trying to do anything. And um, the, the people of East Pakistan, um, the Bengalis of East Pakistan, voted overwhelmingly for uh, the party of Sheikh Mujib, the Awami League. Um, and this, of course, famously triggered the War of Independence that happened next. Um, this is actually a screenshot from a, a film. You can see this film, and I've, I've drawn on this film a lot in this paper. I say this paper uses a lot of different methods. I look at film, photography, music, concerts, um, and I look at um, oral history testimonies of US aid officials, US State Department officials. Quite, quite a fun um, and eclectic mix of of sources, actually not fun at all, they're deeply depressing, but anyway. Um, I want. To, I don't want to, I, I struggled with this a bit, I was going to show you some pictures of the devastation of the of the Bola cyclone, but instead I'm going to read to you from um, a New York Times account by Sidney Schoenberg, who describes um, the conditions after the Bola cyclone. He says, a lone dog, a mangy brown mongrel survived on the island of Shakuchia. Most of the birds are gone, killed or driven off by the cyclone. That is why no vultures had descended on the corpses, which had lain untouched and blackened in the sun until they were haphazardly buried. And in the same article, uh, Sidney Schoenberg describes the ordeal of a couple, 40-year-old farmer Munshi Mustansha Billa and his wife. And they had had to watch helplessly as each one, one, of, one by one, each of their five children was torn away uh, from their grasp, they were holding onto the children one by one, each of them was torn away by howling winds and waves. Finally, and this is the couple who are left behind after all five of their children have been washed out to sea, sapped of all strength, they fell down on the sodden earth and wept themselves to sleep. Their skin had been scraped raw, their clothes had been ripped off by the storm, and you could not have a clearer statement of their life if you tried. Um, the, the Bola cyclone had a number of really profound impacts. First, of course, it triggered the liberation war that, that resulted in Bangladesh. Actually, this has been surprisingly little um, attention been paid to this, even in a time when we think about climate change and, and disasters and the politics of disaster a lot. It's, it's surprising how little um, has been written about this. Oh, I should say disasters published my piece on the Bola cyclone a few years ago, and they have made it open access for to, to mark the 50th anniversary of so that's available online if you like. But the impacts were very profound. Um, uh, some uh, NGOs, some of the big international NGOs like MSF got their start in the Bola Cyclone. The founder of the international NGO BRAC, which was founded in Bangladesh, um, uh, the late FH Abed, was ironically enough working for a petrol company in those days, in 1971, uh, 1970. And uh, he got a boat and went out to see if he could help. This was his first experience of relief work. Um, and he said in a, in a oral history later, uh, oral history interview later, he said that he learned a lot about the fragility of the life of poor people from that. And, you know, eventually set up RAC and the rest is history. But what was really interesting really is that the world saw this uh, really densely populated, very poor country for the first time properly. You know, the outside world had not actually seen this. You know, in, in 1972, the CIA, 
wrote its first report on Bangladesh uh, for the United States government. And they noted that you know, this, this, this concentration of poverty and population had previously been obscured by membership of the larger entity. So before, you know, these people were always poor, but nobody had ever noticed them before because they were part of Pakistan or part of India or part of Bengal. Um, and so their poverty wasn't quite so obvious. It was averaged out, I suppose, by others. So it was a real striking shock to see that such a place, such people could exist. Um, the second moment I wanted to talk about is this moment when the lovely Henry Kissinger um, used the phrase basket case. And I should say, um, it was not actually his phrase to begin with. Um, somebody else uh, said it and he just repeated it. But he was such an important and influential person. Um, it really has stuck, it has stuck to this day still now. Bangladeshis will talk about um, this phrase about being a basket case. When The Economist writes yet another one of its articles about how well Bangladesh has been doing economically, um, it always says, oh, not a basket case anymore. It seems that we will never outlive this stupid tagline. Um, but it's, it's very interesting. This was this was the phrase used, you know, I think the, the a lot of Bangladeshis know this exchange pretty well, but a lot of other people don't. I'd like to um, talk about it because I think it is really important. Um, the, the phrase was used um, in a Washington Special Actions Group meeting. This, these, are, these, are, these are quite high level crisis meetings and it was, it was high level enough, important enough for them to actually hide. Um, they, had, they, had, they had one for the cameras. They staged a fake meeting for the cameras. They had a real meeting in the, in the basement of the White House where they, there were no cameras. But Jack Anderson, who was, who was billed as America's most famous in, in investigative reporter, he broke the basket case story before those documents were made public. Um, and otherwise we wouldn't have known until more recently. I've reproduced here um, some of the exchange. It's, it's very interesting to me that, you know, they're talking about, you know, the, the refugee crisis and they're talking about the, the conflict and the, the war and so on. In Bangladesh, the Indians have just come in uh, on the Bangladesh side. Um, at this point in December 1971, and and almost almost apropos of nothing, Kissinger starts asking about famine. Um, will there be famine? And and uh, the USA administration says yes, unless unless we help them, unless they sort themselves out. And he says, and we have to think about what our policy will be. They will not necessarily be our basket case. He says when Johnson, I don't know which Johnson this was, says there'll be an international basket case. These documents are all freely available online. Anyone can look at these. Um, one reason I thought this was so important, this, this exchange is so important, um, is it reminds me very much of, um, of the a few years ago when Pr President Trump described um, various African and other countries as shitholes. Um, basket case is another kind of, it's a crude, I think, a crude foreign polypressy the signals a complete lack of interest in this space. Nothing to do with us. We have nothing to do with this. We're not interested um, in, in this, this far off place. And it, it does, you know, I think this lack of interest in Bangladesh um, in the US has suddenly lingered. Um, I think uh, it's, it's very striking that, the, that they had already thought about this famine, this possibility of this famine and, and, and what the American response should be. And I think this really um, rings alarm bells for me when we fast forward to 1974, which I'm not actually going to cover today, but which I have written a whole book about. In 1974, there was the last big famine in Bangladesh. Um, uh, one and a half million people died, um, up to 2% of the population at the time. And um, American food aid was withheld at the last moment because um, Bangladesh was uh, had traded for five million dollars worth of jute sacks with um, Cuba and under the public law 480 um, American uh, food aid could not go to countries that were trading with communist countries although other countries which were also trading with communist countries like Egypt at the time uh, were given food aid but Bangladesh was not given food aid um, and it was it was deliberate to or is believed to have been quite deliberate to a set power, set control of Bangladesh. I, I, I want you to also draw attention to this rather little known um, book, a theory, a theory, um, which was, it seems fairly influential at the time. I'm finding it hard, I have found it hard to, to find any 
hard evidence of this, but there are references to this triage theory um, in, um, in, in some of the oral histories and the other testimonies of the time. And I think that this probably did in, it inform some of the US thinking about um, famine relief, food, food aid in Bangladesh at this time. Um, this was a, you know, this book was a, it's, it's, all, it's almost quite funny now when you read it because it's, it's, it's so um, over the top and it's so overblown. Although in fact, they were correct that there were famines all across the world in the early, in 1974 around the food crisis. So in some ways it's, you know, it was quite prescient. Um, but in 1968, when this book was, was um, written, um, they, the authors uh, said, among other things, um, America's bountiful land has imposed on us a noblesse oblige, which we must face up to. Before the end of the 1970s, the interplay of power politics will be based on who is starving and who is not, who has extra food to send to others and who has not. Food will be the basis for power. Here, the sophistication will lie in the need for the food nation to select which countries, out of the many hungry ones, will receive its limited food stocks, which countries will be left in the miseries of their starvation. So this book, I think, was quite influential. I think it was it was of a piece with um, uh, oh, I've forgotten his name. I want to say Garrett Hardin. Garrett Hardin's uh, Lifeboat Ethics, which was essentially a, a philosophy that's actually quite familiar to us um, uh, from the last few years. Which is they they just the West cannot do anything for the uh, poorer countries. They have to sort themselves out. There's only so much space um, for us rich people. Um, and I think this is, you know, certainly triage theory and lifeboat ethics want to be looked at again in this context. The third moment of great interest to me is the concept for Bangladesh. And here I have to say, I feel I have quite mixed feelings about this because as a child, I remember seeing the record. We always had the record when I was a kid, my parents had it. Um, and we used to think it was quite marvelous that you know, an actual beetle would do so much for, for Bangladesh. Um, and I have written a longer piece about this, which, which talks a little bit about my ambivalence about it. Um, but in turn, and, and, and you know, George Harrison's wonderful man and the solidarity with Ravi Shankar, this was a concept um, devised in, it, it, it happened on the 1st of August, 1971 in Madison Square Garden, New York. Um, the Indian musician Ravi Shankar and the former Beatle George Harrison organized this concert and invited all their friends invited, among other things, Bob Dylan. It was quite an amazing concert. If you watch it now, you can see a film version of it. It's, it's quite, it, was quite, it was quite an experience. And it was, of course, the model for Live Aid and all the rest of it. The idea, officially at least, was to, um, was to raise money for refugees. But actually, I, I believe now that there was a much more subversive agenda on the part of George Harrison and Ravi Shankar, which was to say the name of Bangladesh. This was still a country that was fighting, was in the middle of the war. This was August, the war didn't end till December. Um, and uh, no country had yet acknowledged, had recognized Bangladesh officially. So they were singing the so these songs and um, organizing concerts for Bangladesh. And I think just by saying these names, singing these names, this was the subversive act. But when you see this image, this was the cover of the, um, of the single that George Harrison uh, released um, you know, the, the, the bare life imagery is, is clear. There's a child possibly dying, obviously a very unwell, uh, malnourished mother. Um, they're very distressing images. The words as well, when you see the, the song that was written, it's really not the, not the finest lyric. Uh, it sure looks like a mess, never seen such distress. Um, it was written rather hurriedly, it must be said, and it raised a lot of attention and awareness should also draw your attention to the first picture here. This is, of course, a very famous image as well. And um, the uh, anthropologist uh, Nainika Mukherjee and the um, global historian Samantha Christensen have written um, very interestingly about the, the concept for Bangladesh and about this image. And I will just um, cite a couple of their, a couple of their um, uh, their thoughts. One is, uh, this is Nainika Mukherjee, she says that image of the child uh, this solidified the image of Bangladesh. The poster featured a starving child with a bowl in front of them. The image of the child was representative of the starving nation, bowl in hand, waiting for the world community, the global civil society, to save it, protect it. Above this image, the poster proclaimed that the Bangladesh Benefit Concert was a triumphant success, a historic event. And Samantha Christensen says, 
by presenting starving babies in need of salvation and the rock and roll benefit concert as the savior, popular music was a conduit through which the West's economic and moral superiority was reaffirmed. Um, and there's some very interesting um, stuff. Um, there's some very interesting um, additional uh, thoughts on that from people like Srinath Raghavan, who wrote a very good book about the origins of Bangladesh, 1971. Um, and he says, um, among other things that, you know, this was a moment when, when rock music was really, was really in a very dark place. And Janis Joplin had, and uh, Jimi Hendrix had both died the previous year. And, and the, you know, the excesses of the sixties were really uh, uh, coming to the fore. And in a way this concert gave new moral purpose. And, you know, the Be everyone thought the Beatles were gonna reform for this concert. There was so much attention to this, to this event. It was quite something. And Bob Dylan came and played. He hadn't played for some years. And, you know, my generation, I think, um, we know Bob Dylan really as the old guy who couldn't sing a live aid. So, you know, to see him perform, he was just brilliant um, at that, at the, in, in 1971. It was a real vintage um, Dylan. It's really worth seeing. Um, I hope I haven't offended anyone with, about who's a big Bob Dylan fan. Um, and finally, I wanted to say about these, these different moments, um, of the 1970s Bangladesh, the construction of Bangladesh's as bare life. So in, this, in these moments, I think we can really see the, the origins of, of this kind of experimentalism, which is essentially a humanitarian experimentalism, but in which human rights are not respected. Um, I, I did quite a lot of looking into USAID um, officials and, and US State Department officials. Um, they, they do these oral testimonies, these histories of their experiences in country and in Bangladesh. Um, nobody mentions the famine of 1974, perhaps because it was so controversial and the US role was so controversial. But 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 American State Department officials make it very clear that the, the, the role of the US in Bangladesh was always purely altruistic. There was never any geostrategic, there was never any diplomatic, there was never any economic aims. All America wanted to do in Bangladesh was to help the poor and the starving. Um, and I think that's really important because it licenses a kind of um, experimentalism, you know, because because the the uh, because the uh, um, the development the U.S. development project in Bangladesh was purely altruistic, um, it therefore made it all right to try out different things. But it also made it really important to show results, to show how many poor people were being made less poor, how many hungry people were being saved, how many. How many, how many babies were not being born because fertility control became a huge part of the whole Malthusian agenda there. Um, there is this um, rather wonderful book by Michelle Murphy, which came out in 2017 called The Economization of Life. I strongly recommend it if anyone's interested in these sorts of issues of biopower and also Bangladesh, it's mostly about Bangladesh. Um, and she talks about the exuberant experimentalism that has happened on the bodies of, of Bangladeshis um, and uh, Garrett mentioned, um, you know, the arsenic in the water. Bangladesh has been subject to the world's largest mass poisoning um, incident uh, because of a UNICEF and World Bank project to build um, uh, water pumps um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, which was just yet another experiment that went wrong. Um, nor plant, so fertility, various fertility drugs have also been tested on the bodies of Bangladeshi women. Um, because it was too unsafe to test them on American women. Um, and this kind of experimentalism persists um, today, sometimes with very positive results. There's been lots of NGO pilots and governmental um, efforts to, to reach poor people, to reach women, um, and so on. Um, so I really wanted to end really by just saying that um, I think things have changed so much in Bangladesh. Um, bare life, you know, these, these, these images continue in people's, in people's minds, but I don't think they are uh, any longer as true as they once were. Um, certainly the, the taking in of the, um, the, the Rohingya refugees fleeing the genocide by the Burmese army um, across the Naf River um, says something very differently about the, says something very different about the way Bangladesh is positioned in the world now, as does its efforts, many efforts to combat climate change on behalf of um, low-income countries. Um, I just think the really cr crucial thing for Bangladesh going forward is um, 
is developing a human rights regime because you can have no bare life in a human rights regime. I think that's really critical. Um, and I'm going to end it there. I think that's my last slide. Thanks, Naomi. So much going on there. There's one question from the audience. Can you read it or I can read it to you or two? There's a few. And actually from there, we can open it up for questions. Okay. Um, we have a question from, is this Ambassador Akbar Ahmed? Um, how would you explain the fact that the economic trade and commerce figures, etc., for Bangladesh are better than those of Pakistan, although when the two were together, it was the other way around? What are the lessons other nations in the region can learn from Bangladesh? Well, what an excellent question. Um, it's, a, it's the kind of question I love answering. So thank you very much, Ambassador Akbar Ahmed. And um, my answer to this, and actually there have been a couple of, there are a couple of op-eds in, in the Pakistani press the last few years about this, about specifically this, and I think they do actually draw on my aid lab book to discuss this. I think you have um, in Bangladesh a kind of a social contract, um, a kind of a, an elite consensus about the need for um, poverty reduction that really focuses on the rural poor, that focuses on women, and, and, and this has really given the foundations to um, a quite a lot of human development success, I think, that has not been uh, quite so evident in Pakistan. Um, I'd say that would be the foundation of, of, of the, uh, you know, the, the governmental investment in, 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 in very pro-poor development. I mean, with limits, of course, but this, this elite consensus has been important. Every government that has come in has done more or less the same policies. Um, with respect to uh, you know, uh, food security and um, health and education, social protection, and so on, more or less the same. That's, that's been an important part of the story there. Um, and we've had you know more or less unbroken, more or less unbroken until well, okay, we had a long period of democracy of multi-partyism anyway, which you've only recently been getting in Pakistan. So that would be another explanation, I think. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Happy to debate further with you, though. So I think they're asking for people to put questions in the Q&A box, but we're such a small group, people can talk. Um, I have a general question, Naomi, about sovereignty. Um, a lot of your work intersects with food independence and the politics of you know, the biopower becoming dependent upon another country for food imports. Um, is there much discussion in Bangladesh right now about like a food sovereignty or kind of a cultural or national or ecological sovereignty that's grounded in agricultural production or in kind of a climate resilient agriculture? No, good question. And we don't use, uh, I don't think we still use the term food sovereignty in Bangladesh, but certainly food security and self-reliance, particularly around grains has been very, very critical. In Bangladesh and it was very striking in 2008 when the big food crisis, the last big food crisis we should probably say, last big global food crisis happened before the one that's coming just now, um, but that one, um, you know, where the, the World Bank and others have been strongly promoting um, reliance on international food trade. Why would you, why would you invest in your own um, food reserves? Why would you build uh, warehouses and why would you support your local farmers because you can always buy everything on the international market and then of course in 2008 you know india closed its borders uh, i think thailand closed its borders the rice producers closed their borders because prices were rising and everyone knows the price of rice is the most important political factor in asia um, and so then bangladeshis were facing spiraling food prices and the world bank came down from that and now this sense that you can you don't need to be food self-reliant anymore has really shifted in Bangladesh and lots of investments in agriculture but not sovereignty they don't use that language they talk about self-reliance and you know it goes back so long it goes back to 1974 which was the famine I think that was the really critical turning point uh, in 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 politics and in the state citizen relationship Somebody's got their hand up. Pro Professor Freeman, Scott Freeman, has a question heading out. Sure, he says, to what extent is the aid experiment unique to Bangladesh? And to what extent is this a feature of aid development writ large? He does work in the Caribbean. Thinking about other spaces where this logic discourse might be applied globally. 
I think that's a very good question. I do get asked this quite a lot. I think Nepal is another place where um, people say, oh, well, it's the same there too. I think it's not unique to Bangladesh. Um, I think it's, um, in some ways, it's it's kind of clearest and sharpest in Bangladesh because you know, m many of these many of these countries that have invested heavily in aid in Bangladesh have it's, it's been it's been a, a big investment for them. So it's been really important to show that to show those results. Um, and I think that's been that's been really why it stands out so much in Bangladesh. Also, of course, you know, Bangladesh. I always forget to say this, and I you know because I don't know how much people know about. Uh, Bangladesh. I always say, you know, in the US, sometimes when I say I'm from Bangladesh, people look at me and I think, but she doesn't look African, because I don't think people know um, even that about Bangladesh, the where we are or anything like that. But, um, you know, it's the eighth biggest country in the world by population. It's huge, huge. Um, and uh, I think the 40th biggest country by total economy size. So we're, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not minnows, it's a huge place. It's, it's, you know, just the scale of it makes it important. I think though that in, um, Scott's question is very good because you know, a, lot, a lot of the aid agencies, I think, and the NGOs um, have actually cut their teeth in Bangladesh. You often meet people who have had a posting there or did their PhD there or did some research there. You know, we, we get a lot of, we get a lot of um, aid wallers coming through and a lot of people have learned their craft I think that's partly why it's so important there. Um, and, you know, as, as people sometimes used to say in Bangladesh, I shouldn't say it now, but used to say in Bangladesh, you know, we, we export our poverty. This is, this is our, you know, what we have, but it's not, it's not true anymore, even if it was true before. But Scott's question, I think David had a similar one, didn't he? Yes. Lewis. Yeah. Um, David asks, uh, does this idea of humanitarian experimentalism, is it, is it a distinctive form in 1970s Bangladesh or does it have a longer history? For instance, Kamila East Pakistan, colonial flood control reliefs. And is it also a key aspect of most development interventions beyond humanitarian relief? Well, I think, I think what I'm trying to say here, and I maybe haven't uh, conveyed it very well, maybe it'll come across clearer in the paper. Um, what I'm trying to say really is that, you know, this, this, this construction of bare life, this, this treatment of Bangladeshis as absolutely helpless, hopeless and needing, needing support was important because it, it, it gave a kind of life sense. You know, it's, it's this, um, you know, the economic anthropology, the idea of the gift in, in anthropology, you know, the, the gift without return, of course, really empowers the, um, empowers the giver above the, you know, the receiver. And I think this is what happens with, uh, I think humanitarian experimentalism is all about this. And we can try things out because there is a kind of utilitarian view that will benefit the greatest number and so on. Um, was it unique to 70s Bangladesh? No, it's, it's persisted and it, it's, it's not only in Bangladesh. I think, you know, I, I, I like to show the concert for Bangladesh in particular because it was such a seminal moment, but afterwards there have been so many others. There have been all the live aids and the feed the world and some other real um, atrocities against music and um, humanitarianism. But, um, you know, very influential and all of this was learned in Bangladesh, was, was, was um, uh, you know, forged in Bangladesh. Garrett, are you going to be um, uh, telling me which ones to answer and so on? Sure. Yes, there's, there's a few that kind of talk about this humanitarian and this history of aid, particularly relevant for the SIS community, where we have students and a lot of our practitioner expertise is in the development industry, the development project. So this is extremely relevant. Um, Jesse, Professor Rabo says, yes. there was a 150 fold reduction in fatalities in Bangladesh from over half a million um, to 3,406 3, deaths between comparable cyclones of Bola and Sidr, same magnitude mm -hmm. and hitting the same coast. So how would you and other scholars and historians of the region explain this vast reduction? And another great question and another one that I kind of topic I really like to answer. I will send you, Jesse, my paper on the Bola cyclone um, and also the cyclone, the Amphan, Amphan cycle, cyclone, which just happened in, was it in May? Um, you know, I think I think 12 people died and it was a, it was a huge um, it was a huge you know in in, in terms of the, the the science of the 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 you know the the scale of it it was huge but it, it has essentially to do with very very good um, systems of uh, communication information uh, early warning cyclone shelters people are much better prepared 
people trust the government, people trust the official agencies when they say, oh, you've got to clear out, you've got to evacuate because there's a big one coming, which they didn't do in 1970. Um, there's a whole range of things. There's quite a lot written about this, but not very much of it's been written from a political um, perspective. I think Mark Pelling, um, the geographer Mark Pelling has, has done some work in this area, um, looking at the kind of social contract that emerged out of Pola, which I think is very important um, set of um, conclusions to draw from that. I mean, it is, it's not that it's all really beautiful and easy now. I mean, cyclone relief is still a huge big issue and actually they're just getting more devastating with climate change, but um, um, but yes, there's a lot has been, a lot has changed in the capacity of the government to address it. Um, when the government's got a um, from Rachel Robinson, professor at SAS, about how does this speak to Bangladesh's current mitigation and adaptation strategies, particularly adaptation from rising sea levels to stronger and more intense hurricanes, and has this history of dealing with e extreme hurricanes um, kind of helped both Bangladesh, but also the region and the world think through broader m adaptation? So, uh, I mean, I, you know, Garrett, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a climate change um, expert at all. Um, I think I think what I would answer is the um, is the kind of political arrangements that have made these sorts of um, this sort of progress possible. Um, and there, as I said before, you know, very strong elite consensus on consensus on the things that needed to happen so that um, Bangladesh could could be a viable country so that the elites themselves weren't threatened by, um, you know, assassination and uh, loss of legitimacy and so on. I think those really are the critical questions. I mean, Bangladesh is, continues to um, do an enormous range of uh, adaptive programs and uh, policies. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of everyday uh, coping and adaptation and so on. Um, Bangladesh is involved in some quite high level um, spaces, policy spaces, global policy spaces now, and it takes the leadership of the I can't remember what the group is called now, the most affected poor countries um, that are affected by climate change. Um, and so it plays quite a kind of policy role there. Um, people like Salim al -Haq, um, have been very influential in shaping global discourse on adaptation and climate change, um, which I think is, tells you a lot about how far we've come since then. But you know, the, 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 the storms are not getting um, any, uh, gentler. Um, it's, and, and there are many, many more people living in those areas in the south uh, than there were 50 years ago. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's getting harder, not easier, if anything. Um, Thank think. you. Um, and then related, there's a whole stream of questions also about this development laboratory, this, this thesis that you've been developing over the past few um, publications. Um, and so Professor Broad, Robin, asks that she first read with horror about the arsenic and foreign funded wells in Bangladesh back in the late 70s, thanks to Betsy Harmon and James Boyce's work. But she says still to this day within the development industry and scholarship, not, it's not as known as it needs to be considering it was the mass, you know, kind of poisoning um, in, in recorded history recently. So to what extent were lessons learned by development practitioners within Bangladesh and then within the, the broader world. And even is in Bangladesh, is it well known that history? Is that kind of common parlance? Are people still thinking that through in the politics of aid and development with that reference? Um, just on, on, on arsenic poisoning, I mean, this, uh, you know, I should know more. It's another thing I, 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 should, I should write up more, I think, because I, I don't think, I think you're right, right, Robin. I don't think people really know that story very well. Um, it's astonishing uh, people have, really suffered many millions of people have really suffered and there's been there has been some research and there's been um, quite a lot of um uh randomized control trials going on uh in in on, on the arsenic issue in 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 bangladesh um some of them of quite dubious ethics frankly um there was one piece of work that was done which uh concluded that the parents of children who stopped giving their children um, arsenic poisoned water once it was known, um, did the wrong thing because more children died from drinking contaminated groundwater. So, you know, your usual kind of cholera infested um, groundwater than, than would have done from died of arsenic. The implication being that 
parents were wrong not to have given their, not to have knowingly fed their children poisoned water. So this is the kind of research that we face uh, currently in Bangladesh. I think this is um, astonishingly bad on, on, on ethical grounds, let alone research grounds. So this, this sort of thing goes on. Um, it's not well known, there's not much can be done about it. I mean, it's one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm so invested in accountability research at the Accountability Research Center, is that there's, there's all of these, I think of them as egregious episodes of unaccountability, of failures of accountability, and this is one of them, where nobody ever paid any price. So an effort was made to take um, the company to court that did the geographical surveying work for the, for the, um, for the pumps, for the, for the water project, um, and this failed. Eventually it, uh, it was thrown out of court. They never, they never uh, got them to um, accept legal liability for, um, for the failure to check properly for the arsenic in the water. Yeah, it's really shocking. <laughs> I'm still really shocked when I think about it. Um, all sorts of efforts have been made to manage the, you know, the science of it, um, to, to reduce the arsenic and so on, but it's, yeah, Bangladesh, we still get these sorts of programs every now and then. People are more careful now than they were, but we still get things like this in the world. Um, Hassan Ashraf asks, how would you connect your work with Zainal Abedin's famine sketches and the context with which those sketches are nested? So uh, Zainal Abedin, Zainal Abedin is a, you know, probably our, can we say national artist in Bangladesh, can we say? Um, a really amazing figure. He, he uh, drew these, um, let me see if I can find one. He drew these um, pen and ink sketches of the 1943 famine um, in Bengal. And um, they were very famous and uh, they did have some impact, it seems, on raising awareness um, of, of the, the horrors of the, let's call it what it is, the Winston Churchill famine. Um, Um, can you see these pictures? Yes. So these are some of the famous Zainal Labadin ones, so 1943. Now, what's interesting though, is um, he was then, so, you know, Bangladesh, or rather Bengal, you know, gets independence from the British, uh, 47, becomes East Pakistan, uh, and then in 71 becomes Bangladesh, and then in 74, there is another famine, and this famine was, of course, under a, um, a sovereign state, um, newly independent. And at this point, Zainal Abedin was the uh, head of the arts. Um, Ashraf, you'll be able to, you'll be able to remind us. Um, the head of essentially the, the 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 artist, the head of the art, the big art, the big artist for the whole country. He was I can't remember like the art art laureate equivalent. I can't think what the t the term is. Head of the anyway, uh, and he did actually also do one picture that I know of of 1974, and it it resembles very much a, a one of these famine sketches from 43. I'm going to stop. This is really upsetting, um, but only one and nobody ever talks about it. So nobody really talks about 1974. There is very little, there's only one novel that I know of um, about 1974. There are no films about 1974. And I think this is not that surprising in a way because you know the Irish say about the Irish famine that it took them 80 years or so before people could write about it, talk about it, it was such a trauma. And when I've spoken to Bangladeshis about 1974, those of, those of us who are old enough to remember, they say, oh, it was, you know, we don't, we don't like to talk about it. We don't think about it. You know, we forget about it. It was such a trauma. Um, and some of my friends have said to me, you know, we, we felt guilty because um, people died because we were, we ate middle class people. So there's a kind of a um, silence there, you know, about the, about the famine that is, is there in the erasures in art and film and so on. Still, if you talk about famine in that part of the world, people mean 1943. Nobody talks about 1974. I mean, there's political reasons for that as well. Don't want to go into those now. The Institute of Fine Arts in Dhaka, Hassan Ashraf. Thank you. Thank you.
I, I knew you'd know. <laughs> yes, so, there is a pair of pictures. I'll share them with you, Ashraf. Um, such important history. 70s were not that long ago. I think you began by saying this is old history, but I think reading your paper and thinking this through how recent it is, and yet the erasures that are there are so important to unpack. Um, so there's two questions about Bangladesh's experience with disaster management and mitigation and climate mitigation. And so Jamil of University of Bristol asks, um, what are some of the approaches that Bangladesh can take to share its experience and expertise in disaster management and rehabilitation with global communities since this is the new norm? And then mm -hmm. Jesse asks a follow-up, do you see climate change adaptation discourses in Bangladesh as diverting attention away from the everyday livelihoods and challenges of non-climate related priorities? Let me take Jesse's question first. I mean, I think it's possible. I think it's very possible. I don't, I don't know enough about the climate change discourse is really to, um, uh, to say for sure. I think it is very possible that NGOs and, and, and local governments and, and uh, movements have to justify whatever they need to do in terms of climate change, but that's not that hard to do in Bangladesh. It's, it's um, you know, it's a very lived reality. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how people live with the effects of climate change on a daily basis. And so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that I'm, yeah, I, I think probably it doesn't take away from uh, other livelihood efforts. Um, you know, whether, whether it's urban or rural, I think everyone's lives are affected by climate change in a very direct um, way, seasonally, but also, you know, across the, across the board. But it is possible, I think, that having to flag climate change all the time does, does uh, cause difficulties. Um, and Jamil, your question about what can be learned, I mean, I. You know, I'm not I'm not in the business really of, 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 of technocratic solutions just now, but I think that you know there is a real accountability there. There is a real um, you know a, political legitimacy depends very much in Bangladesh on 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 at least the effort to to show um, willing to uh, deal with the effects of uh, climate change, deal with the with, to deal with disasters, but very importantly also to to prevent you know it's uh, it's it's what happens in in Bangladesh is that if a government does not properly address a, a storm or a disaster they'll know about it either in the next election or if elections are no longer possible um, or meaningful as is currently the case people will find other ways to show that that the government has lost legitimacy I don't know I don't know in other countries you know I, I watched I watched you know Hurricane Maria here um, in fact, I did write a, a blog comparing, uh, you know, President Trump's response to the Puerto Rican cyclone with the Pakistani military ruler's response in Bangladesh. And of course, it triggered a civil war in Bangladesh. Um, it did not in Puerto Rico, but the similarities with the way the place was spoken about are very, very close. The entire lack of um, accountability for that that disaster in Puerto Rico by the central government in this country, I think, is very striking. So you have to politicize it. Is the message on that note? There's a comment by Professor Ahmed Ahmed, which I wish he could give, you know, live. I don't know if we can make that happen. I think not through Zoom. But he says he was subdivisional officer in charge of Manik Ganj when the cyclone hit East Pakistan. And the scale of the devastation made it clear to me that unless Pakistan acted swiftly, it would be unable to contain the anger that had risen. West Pakistan believed that its own ethnic stereotypes and never took the demands that followed East Pakistan seriously. The writing was on the wall, but West Pakistan ignored it. I have my diaries from 1970-1971 on my time in Kishore Ganj and the Manik Ganj and would be happy to share them with Professor Hussein and will add a dimension to her work. That's wonderful. Amazing. Thank so much. I'm really looking Thank forward. I'll definitely connect with you immediately. Thank you so much for that. I'll be really interested to hear your, your recollections. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and Beniak says that some short stories were written, though, about the 1974 famine, notably by Hassan Azizul Haq, and of course, some powerful poems by Rafiq Azad and Shamsur Rahman. There is the, is it the white shirt? Um, there are one or two really famous poems. In fact, some people have shared them with me. Yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's still it is it is there is that trauma there is that kind of slight shade you know people don't like to look at it now you know I know and and been like though it's really important I think to know people of so I was born in seventy one people who are younger than me do not know 
about the famine of 74. And so they do not know that Bangladesh learned so much. I think this is really an important lesson um, for our history uh, that we need to keep sharing with the younger generation. Anyway, that's part of the reason why I do this work. And David Lewis says that it's interesting that in some countries, Sweden, for instance, people objected to the cover of the George Harrison Bangladesh single, and it was withdrawn, the cover, not the record. So a politics of famine, you know, visualization mm -hmm. and appropriation. It would be interesting to know more about how such images came to be accepted or contested over time. Very interesting. Well, the Swedes are always a bit ahead of us, aren't they? Um, that's very interesting. I didn't know that, David, you know, it's a, uh, um, I, all I know is I read loads and loads of biographies and autobiographies and so on from the people involved in the concert. And one thing was very clear was that the cover of the album, I'm talking about not the single, um, the record company said it was uncommercial. And George Harrison said he didn't care and he just wanted that image. And so they went ahead with it. So I'd love to talk more about the concert for Bangladesh with you, David and others another time. Well, it's, it's high noon here on the Eastern <laughs> Standard Time, so um, I think we won't take any more. I don't know if Jordana, you wanted to turn on your, your video and we'll lead a round of applause for Dr. Naomi Hossein. We're so honored to have you join us and share your research and your expertise and um, we'll stay in communication. And um, there's lots of thank yous in the Q&A in the chat, so much gratitude. And to everyone else, please join us for our next Ethnographies of Empire talk. And actually, I think we'll be having Naomi join us next semester for some panels and roundtables to continue to flesh out these important discussions of liberalism and biopower and empire. Thank you so much. And thank you for wonderful questions. And I'll follow up with those of you I've said. Thank you so much. <laughs>